with the little introduction about Rajiv. So, <clears throat> Rajiv is the founder of the Rajiv Care Selection, and uh, he's most well known for his knowledge and passion for old world wines and champagne. And he's also very well known for bringing a lot of the greatest selection in wines to India itself. I think he describes his portfolio as unpolished and polished diamonds because he has a selection of portfolio that focuses not only on wines that are meant to age well, but also wines that are meant for immediate consumption. So uh, I think without any further ado, I think Rajiv, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tony. I've, I'm here. I've known Tony since a long time. And uh, when he uh, invited me to join, I said, wow, these are very brilliant people. And where the hell am I? you know, landing up, and especially after the, the talk that preceded mine. I have a tough, tough task ahead of me, especially since it's at the depressed hour of 4 o'clock. <laughs> so, so uh, two, two tough uh, battles to conquer, but hopefully uh, booze shall, uh, shall aid me and assist me. But wine is really not about booze, uh, because if you use the word booze, booze is at least in my mind, it, it conjures up images of drinking, uh, getting a little bit high or drunk or whatever. Uh, you certainly don't choose wine to do that. For one, there are other drinks that uh, can achieve that faster with less uh, volume and for less money. So, what is it then that, that makes wine what it is, is so special? In In... In the Western culture, especially in uh, a country like France, it's, it's not just a drink. It, it's part of culture. It's like in, in India, if you don't know, or anywhere in the world, if you don't know movies by great producers, you don't know works of art, or works of literature, or works of music, wine is, is placed in that same context there. It's a way to, to really judge, is this person, uh, I won't use the word sophisticated, I would say cultured. And, and then we come back, I'll come back later on, swing back to that, why it is you know, defined as being cultured. But let's just go on from there to again raise a question. What is a definition of a good wine? You know, how do you define a good wine. And, and really speaking, a, a good wine, first and foremost, needs to be one that is genuine. Okay, so in some ways, like these brilliant ads we saw, it needs to connect. And, and there is a term out there which is used, uh, which says a technical wine. Now, a technical wine is a wine that you would taste, you would smell it, because those are some of the components which allows you to understand the wine, aromatics, flavor, um, and, and, and you find everything is right. But yet it's, it's technical. Why do you say that it's technical? Because it's, if it's badly made, the nose is going in one direction and the taste is going in another direction. And if it's well made, they're, they're in harmony, but yet you see this is not genuine. And, and, you, and, and this is in, when, you, when you taste and drink wine and smell wine, you look for authenticity. Hmm? And that comes from a word which is, is common in wine called terroir. So terroir is a word that is used to define the factors that makes a wine unique and what it should be. So the elements of terroir is the, the area where it comes from. The area where it comes from again comes into geography, it's altitude, it's uh, orientation, because orientation is very important in terms of ripening of the grape. You know, uh, a south-facing vineyard 
always will have more ripening than a north-facing vineyard. You, you would then speak about the soil. The soil is a major component of what ends up defining the taste of the wine. You can go into it in even greater detail. It's not just the, the soil, the top soil, the bottom soil. Now, one of the greatest wines out there is something that is produced in Bordeaux, um, on the right bank of Bordeaux. And the right bank of Bordeaux is where the grape Merlot shines. Left bank of Bordeaux is where the grape Cabernet Sauvignon shines. And, and this is historical. So the, the name of this estate, whose bottles sell for roughly, on an average, uh, a young wine. And when I use the word young wine, it's to, to communicate the fact that a young wine sells for less than an older one. Um, simply because an older wine is more mature, more ready, more perfect. Uh, so this, the, the wine that I, that I refer to is called Petrus. The average price outside of India, and that is without our taxes and duties and whatever, um, is around, say, 3,000 euros for a young bottle of wine. And what, what is one of the factors that makes Petrus so special? There is supposed to be in the subsoil a blue strain of some kind of quartz or granite or whatever it is. And some of the greatest vineyards in the world have this peculiar blue strain going through there. Now, the region that I'm most fond of is Burgundy. And Burgundy is home for Pinot Noir, which is a fecal grape and Chardonnay. Chardonnay is a white wine grape, Pinot Noir is a red wine grape. Now Burgundy, if you, if you look at it, and it's there on my website, if you see it, it is a result of, uh, from, it, it goes on to say, the Jurassic period and so on and so forth. Basically, it was a former seabed. And now there's a lot of, in, in the soil, uh, there is a lot of marine life, which gives the wine its uh, minerality. But also, there is, there is a little romantic element to it for me, you see. Most wines from most parts of the world, is, they use the word sepage. Sepage means a blend. To, 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 you do a little bit of kali mirch, dhania, whatever. Funda is the same. You do that same thing for wine. Basically, you mix a Bordeaux blend means what? The key, four constituents. Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Petit Verdot, and Cabernet Franc. And, and you're allowed to change every year the, the composition to achieve the taste that you think is working best for that year. Burgundy is just one grape. So that's it. It's as honest as it gets. You have nothing to add this and do this or remove this and, uh, and all of that. So that's one factor. Another element of terroir is when you age the wine, and that the, the use of word, the French use of word called élevage, and you age it for one year, two years, and again there is different theories. You could go into 100% new oak, less oak, so on and so forth. These are different ways. So the other element of terroir comes down to the man. The man is taking decisions. It's something coming from somewhere, but he's taking a decision. I'm going to extract so much, I'm going to age it in this way, I'm going to age it in this kind of bar barrel, so on and so forth. So those are certain elements of terroir. So now that we have touched upon things that make a wine different from here, there, wherever, then the question comes is next, there's two things in wine. One is new world, old world. Huh? What is this? Basically simple, old world means where they were making wine since a long time. And normally long time is, is, is usually equated to the Roman times. So they, they have a culture of producing wine there. That means their weather, their soil is suitable for wine production. So, okay. So what if these guys knew it, maybe we can do it also. Unfortunately, for whatever reasons, most parts of the world that have started to make wine post this, say India, for instance, um, have a hotter climate. And therefore, hotter climate, there is within grapes, you, you speak of two things. You speak of phenolic maturity. So, in, 
and and that's coming back to the kaju thing, you know, when you when you taste it and it tasted so sharp, it was cutting your tongue. Uh, phenolic maturity is coming down to the taste. There's a bitterness if it's not phenolically right. And and the way the 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 winemakers taste that is they bite the grape and the the seed of the grape is called the pip. They taste the pip and that's how it, they get to know what is the maturity. Of course, then they put it in the lab and they do the analysis and so on and so forth. But in most parts of the new world, for by the time the grape achieves phenolic maturity, the sugar level is very high. And the sugar is what gets converted by the fermentation process into alcohol. So the new world wines end up and have to become much more alcoholic. Now much more alcoholic, how the hell does it matter? It does really matter, okay? I, I suppose most of you drink beer. Beer is usually five or six percent alcohol. At least when I was growing up, one of the things was that, what was it, Thunderbird or there was some some beer, something like that, some name. And I'm sure there are others out there. But if you if you have a beer which is eight percent, that thing knocks you out, man. That eight percent beer is a killer. Same thing goes for whiskey. I used to drink whiskey. I used to even drink it neat. Normal whiskey is 40, 42 proof. Then they have a sort of some expensive sort of collectible whiskeys called cast strength, which is around 52 proof. So it's 10 percent more, yeah. But that 52 proof, boy, it knocks the hell out of you. The same thing goes for wine. If it's 13, 13 and a half percent, there is a certain uh, reaction to it. And the moment it crosses that, there's a different effect to it. So this is... Why? One of the factors that new world, old world, I, I'm an old world fan, so one of the reasons this is why I explain that. But it's also a lot more to do with it because you, you within wines, you, let's say Chile, the best producers, the most highly rated producers today are still discovering on this part of the Andes, the slope, what is the best grape to plant there? It's, it's still a process of learning. You, you do that. And in the old world, they not only have figured out, if you, visit, if you visit one of these estates and say it's planted 65% to Cabernet Sauvignon, you will find that this plot is what they call clone XYZ. And that plot is also Cabernet Sauvignon, but another clone. So they have, they've, go, they've had the advantage of being in the game longer, being in the game seriously enough to continue refining, refining, refining. So these are again some uh, factors that uh, makes a role. But coming back to what, what makes a wine special. So I had touched on the word authenticity. And authenticity is again like with anything, it's, it it's must strike, I suppose, somewhere within you as being genuine. So, if I, <laughs> you know, I, I thought about it this morning and I, and I thought of a movie I love, Roman Holiday. Story kya thi, itni fantastic nahi thi. But yet it's a movie that I, you know, I enjoy. I know if it's on TV, I'd love to watch it again. And is it, is it because, you know, the, the princess was so genuine, innocent in, in the role that she played and, and because of the image of her and her voice or what? I don't know. I'm, I'm not the expert on that, but those are certain things. A great wine. allows you to number one, and there are books out there, it is a capture of a moment of time. Because a great wine, or any wine, is bottled in a certain year. Therefore, at its very basic level, it is reflecting the taste of the wine from that area in that year. And that varies. 
For instance, we have in our house, we have a jamun tree. And I don't know for whatever reasons this year, the fruit wasn't as bountiful, as wasn't as juicy as it was last year. I mean, these are different weather conditions. So, wine therefore is reflecting the weather conditions of that year. On a deeper level, you can say it is a reflection of key events in the world that happened in that year. But when you've drunk wine with someone you enjoy, it's not that you had a great time. You could have it, you could have been sad, you could have been happy, you could have celebrated, you could have danced, whatever. But it allows that moment to become a memory. You see, the greatest wine moments create memories. And life is a combination of different memories, good or bad. And that's why sometimes wine is, is able to really be uh, something special. My wife is from Cal and uh, she went to Loreto. Mm -hmm. um, one of her friends some years back who was a professor at the university in the US was uh, was in India and she then invited various ba batch mates to the house for for dinner. And, and then obviously the conversation was, ah, Rajiv loves wine, so everybody, we spoke about wine. And uh, luckily or so, they, they all enjoyed wine. None of them were crazy about wine. And, uh, but they, they, for them, a special moment, anniversary, birthday, whatever, uh, meant you open a bottle of wine. And special moment means you open a better bottle of wine than everyday drinking. It's, so then I spoke to them, what is that wine? There's a term called desert island wine, which is basically saying if you were marooned somewhere, what was the bottle that you would take with you? But anyway, so I spoke to them, what was the wine that you did? Then the one, the great moment. Luckily, I happen to have all of those wines. So it was gave me great pleasure to open the wine that everybody thought was their special memory wine that evening, I said, here, yeah, this is... So sharing is, is a big element of what makes it special versus another form of spirit. So that's, that's something about the, uh, the wine there. Now, so this evening, and uh, I will... I've selected two wines. Um, a white and a red, so that's simple, you get to taste a white and a red. Um, they, they both happen to, I think, um, reflect and give you an idea of what is terroir. So the, I'll speak with the red wine. The red wine is, comes from Italy, northern part of Italy, and the, the region is called Piemonte. The grape that is famous there is Nebbiolo. And again, like Pinot Noir, Nebbiolo loves cold. And uh, ne the word Nebbia, I think in Italy means fog. So it's very foggy. And, uh, and the, those are some of the factors that lead to its taste. It's possibly the most diverse terrain in the world. You, you will have different altitudes, you have it going this way, that way, so many different uh, uh, expositions. So, um, now the, ne I've just opened the bottle, should have actually been opened earlier, um, is, is, is an acidic grape, so, and it's not deep, it's not heavy. It's a bit like Roman Holiday, you know, she's, she's a very petite lady, not a very powerful lady and yet leaves an impression on you. Uh, and this is from a plot called Roque del Annunziata. And Nebbiolo and Barolo at its best. If you talk about the aroma, you are supposed to get the aroma of roses and tar. These are two of the characteristics 
of that grape. And when you get that, then you know. Because also in, in, in wine drinking and wine tasting, at a very high level, it, there's something called blind tasting. A blind tasting is you're at some place and they serve you a wine. And they, they've, there's been movies about it. And you can, and you're supposed to taste, and in exceptional cases, be able to tell, this is from this producer from this year. It's very difficult. I've seen the greatest critics in the world make that mistake. I have been served once a wine in an evening when a friend of mine in Singapore asked me and another gentleman to teach Mary Emily Jacket, who's the granddaughter of the house of Remy Martin. So as French as they come, me, Indian Kalu, I was asked to teach her about French wine. And that same very evening, we were a uh, brilliant sommelier in a black glass in a dark room. He, he brought a, a glass of wine. And I couldn't tell if it was white wine or red wine. Forget Burgundy, forget Cabernet Sauvignon, forget producer, forget year. Yeah, it's, it's supremely humbling. I have been many times. I've even got the year and the producer right. But it's, it's also uh, extremely humbling to be able to uh, do that. So, we, with that, I think, uh, we, um, try and think of rose and tar when you're tasting the red wine. Because, as I said, it's, it has to be a bit of cerebral also and it, uh, it also helps you to remember. But, you know, in, 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 in India, at least, with wine coming, it's still being treated as an aperitif. In the Western culture, it's, it's about wine and food pairing. And at its best, that's when you really hit the jackpot. You know? And take it simple, yaar. Chips with ketchup taste a lot better than chips on its own or ketchup on its own. Samosa with the chutney with it tastes a lot better, samosa or kebab or whatever. So, it's this combination that makes it. And then the same goes for wine and food. When, when chosen well, the wine tastes better and the food tastes better. I've done a pairing one time. Of some, a friend of mine, an old school friend of mine, she sent something called Japanese samosa from somewhere in uh, Chandni Chowk with the Kala Chana. So, Kala Chana is a strong taste, Japanese samosa, crispy. And we paired it with a Bordeaux and it was a brilliant hit. It was a brilliant hit. One time, I don't drink every day, but uh, anyway, one time I was going down to South India for a detox. Panchakarma and uh, and the Panchakarma is a funny thing I had never heard of Panchakarma and one day I was traveling to Zurich and I had some time at the airport and I started chatting with the girl in the pharmacy there and I said you know I have such and such here this that pain whatever and uh, so she said well in Switzerland you can buy this medicine over the counter and this other one you need a prescription for and then she went on to say, why don't you, you're from India, why don't you do Panchakarma? I, I, I really appeared like a Dumbo because I had never heard of Panchakarma in my life. So what the hell is that? Anyway, she said, I've been there and she, I said, oh, tell me where. She printed it out, gave me the name. Okay, I rented a car, I went on for my meeting. I arrived at the meeting there, we chatted about some machines and whatnot. I make medical devices, that's my uh, roji roti, wine is my maja. So I chatted with this guy. I think I was meeting him for the second time. Sab kuch baat ho ke. Then at the end of the conversation, he says, you know, I remember my visit to India. It was brilliant. I loved it. I wish I can go back there. I did Panchakarma. What? <laughs> Panchakarma was following me throughout that trip. Strangely. And I came back to India. I called that doctor. He says, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, we can fit you in this and this. He had to come for three weeks. I say, you mad? Three weeks? Where the hell have I got that much time? So I forgot him for a year and, 
And a year later, the body said, hey, buddy, you better do something about it. So I again gave him a call and we, uh, being a businessman, I love to negotiate. I negotiated 17 days instead of 21. <laughs> you know, I said, my wife will be there 21, I'll be there 17. So the other wine that we have here is a white wine. It's a grape that I love. It's Riesling. Riesling's is very high in minerality. It comes from the terroir for Riesling, anywhere in the world, is slate. And from the slate, there's blue slate, there's red slate, it picks up. This particular producer, his name is Egon Muller. Okay? In, and, and wine, as I said, has been part of the European culture since a long time. And obviously, it was taxed. Agricultural income, even back in the days, was taxed. And, and this is going back to, I don't know, Prussian or whatever, you know, when Germany, Austria, all of it was one country. The Kaiser was the ruler. The, the tax on, on your wine produce, agricultural produce, was related to the price at which the product sold. And Egon Muller, whose wine we're drinking, has been the highest taxed vineyard ever in Germany, from time beginning till today. In fact, if, if, you, if you have the curiosity, you could, there is, for instance, an article, uh, um, a town and country magazine, 10 most expensive wines of the world. And if you see in that list, Egon Muller's TBA, which is his sweetest version of the wine, that is listed at number three and about 15, 18,000 euros a bottle. Yeah. So they, they are very rare wines. It's, uh, it's the only village in Germany where the wine is sold by the name of the village because that village is supposed to be so special. And again, it's not a unique concept. If you come back to it in India, Kagzi Nimbu, or for that matter, Darjeeling tea. Oh, I, I, I'm a big rice eater. So I, I love to get my rice from Orissa or Calcutta. They have something called Govindu Bhog, which is actually a smaller grain and more aromatic. So it, you know, these are some of the things. Um, on, the, on another level, and that's, that'll be my last point, on another level, um, if you drink a lot of booze, you're considered a drunk, basically. You know, sharabi hai. If you drink a lot of wine, they say he's a connoisseur. Or as we say in Delhi, kosonier, you know. <laughs> so, so that's uh, one way. I have drunk enough French wine that they have given me four titles, uh, of which uh, the first one that I got was something called Chevalier de Testabon, which is a knight of Burgundy. And there is an article, uh, Forbes magazine published about, you know, of clubs and how rare it is to get into some clubs or how snobbish it is or whatever, whatever. And in, in New York, uh, the, the Chevalier de Testavon, whose president is a friend of mine, he is Michael Rockefeller from the Rockefeller family, they say is, is a more difficult club to become a member of than say the Harvard club. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, these are just some, some ways. Wine is great as diplomacy, you know. Especially with American companies, if you deal with them, you know, they're very shorty about gifts and things like that, but giving a bottle of wine is not considered, you know, bribing the guy <laughs> or getting him to be a little more amenable or friendly. So, um, with that, I think, um, oh, she's saying five minutes more, so I get, I get, I get to bore you a little bit more. So, um, these are some of the things there. Um, I have, I've had the pleasure of, you know, because I, I, as I said, I make medical devices, I travel a lot. And uh, I've been a foodie, and that's my journey with wine began 30 years ago. When I first went to France, um, 
and uh, I arrived in Paris in the evening on my way to the hotel and I was staying at the Le Meridien Etoile um, which has a jazz club and we're going to be listening to some jazz this evening I believe um, wh while going past the Eiffel Tower I turned my face away I said I'm not going to see it I'll only see it with my wife so I've, I've been in love with Paris since then. I'm still in love with Paris. I think it's a beautiful city. And uh, we arrived there and I met this gentleman who I was supposed to meet. And back in that, those days, I used to drink whiskey. So we went and had a nice uh, single malt. I was, wow, very happy. And then we moved for dinner. And I asked him, okay, uh, what do you suggest? So he suggested a, a dish, a fish dish. And I said, okay, what wine do you suggest? So he suggested Sancerre. Now I didn't know Sancerre. In Delhi, Papuji bootlegger was selling Shabli, not Sancerre. Yeah. So I had <laughs> never had a Sancerre before. And uh, so I said, yeah, let's try that. So that's how the journey began. I, you know, you went, you traveled, you visited. I, I remember he took me to what is called a cave. A cave is a place you go where they have a big selection of wines, you pay a certain price and you get to taste them all. And I was drinking and drinking and he said, no, because as you move on, the better wines are at the end. He says, just, you know, space yourself <laughs> till the better ones <laughs> come. So it, those were very, very early days. Um, possibly today for, for whatever reasons. Um, Many of the world's greatest wine producers, at least the ones that I like drinking, I can count them as close friends. And, and many of them would love to hear my views about their wine. It's because I'm Firstly, because I've indulged myself, so I've had the opportunity, the good fortune of drinking some of the rarest, some of the best on many, many an occasion. So I've trained myself to have an understanding what is considered great. To Somebody told me once, you know, that if, let's say as a travel writer, and you go to review a luxury hotel. You review it, you give some comments. Are those comments as relevant as somebody who's then paying, say, a thousand dollars a night to stay there? It's a different thing when you're going in and reviewing it and s as, a, as, as a freebie versus somebody who's paying a thousand bucks and you might, you, might, you might think differently and you might say, oh, I expect this service or that or whatever. So, um, so I'm a buyer. Therefore, in that respect, like the person going there, I'm able to judge it value for uh, money, shall we use the word? And, and three, coming back to its authenticity, at the greatest level, at the greatest level, there is a sixth dimension of the wine. It's not its aroma, it's not its taste, it's not its balance. It's you feel the spirit of the wine. How is it speaking to you? And there are enough, enough stories of great people out there that have been, uh, you know, moved to tears when they've had that amazing bottle. So it's, it's capable of producing the most profound of emotions uh, uh, possible there. And, and that is, I think you can only judge if you've really looked at it from a, uh, in a very deep way. And that's thumbs up, time's up, and Fido time now. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Anybody with any questions? Highly excited. I'm like, I realize what I'm missing in life. 
<laughs> आज मरने की ख्वाहिश है तो वाइन पी के मरो दैट वॉज सो ब्यूटिफुली आर्टिकुलेटेड you know thank you. it was really wonderful to hear you and i if i if i do a semiotics of wine i'm going to come to you well <laughs> been honor and a pleasure indeed thank you thank you it's wonderful rajiv uh, two quick questions a these uh, numbers these are the best years for wine or what do you have on your business card at the back okay numbers? that that is that is um, another part of my madness um I I love driving and collecting old cars. Okay. And so the the this visiting card of mine on the, on the front of it it says that's the m- motto or the the byline of a company that doesn't exist anymore called Packard Packard Motor Company. And uh, it was considered one of the best cars in america and and it, it goes on to say if you flip the card over you'll say ask the man who owns one mm-hmm. that was their uh, advertising uh, slogan that's all they said and uh, james packard is went on to possibly collect the best watch in the world ever made so these years and 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 they are there to just you know raise some questions or conversation or whatever they are actually vintages of some of the cars that i own so it's <laughs> and, and there's a photo in there of one of my cars oh, okay okay which is my oldest love affair oh. i've been in love with that yeah. car since i was a kid um so it's not wine related my other madness related okay second question what is your uh, take on india's legendary sula wine we have here how does it hold up thank you so um first and foremost rajiv samant is 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 a brilliant marketing fellow he's he's brilliant he's gone to stanford he's is super bright and he's done a brilliant job uh several several problems there the production is so big the production is so big that you cannot you cannot have consistency in quality it's like you take your own garden and you'll find in some part of the garden the musanda flower is doing well in another part of the garden the musanda flower is not doing well musanda likes sun bougainvillea likes sun if it's in the shade it's not going to do well so if it's coming from such a big area there is no way for it to be consistent the other problem that not only sula but anybody in this thing faces is the supply chain is the cold chain because wine is something that uh, can can be affected by temperature talking about temperature they say you know wine should be stored for long term aging between 12 to 14 degrees which is why you say the sellers you know foreign countries everybody has a little cellar in the basement of the house where they keep their wine um there's a friend of mine in in london who's done some of the most amazing um uh, wine tastings organized ever yeah. and he told me a story once about uh, a dinner a christmas party dinner at his in-laws house and they were opening great bottles and this and that and they opened a bottle which didn't taste right so he just put it down and they opened another one drank through at the end of the party when they were run, they drank out of whatever they had and somebody discovered that bottle say oh let's try that that bottle had become very good and it was but it was next to the radiator because it's christmas winter heater going on absolutely the thing that is not supposed to be good for the wine so having heard this story and in india it's difficult to have 12 bottles of the same wine you know you can make best do le aoge teen le aoge whatever and you say okay if you want to have a, a diversified portfolio you'll say i'll get one this one this one that so the odd chance i would have a case and the part of my learning experience because it takes depending on the vintage depending on where the wine is coming from it takes a certain amount of time for the wine to reach its maturity the same 
ब्रॉयलर चिकन जल्दी बन जाएगा देसी मुर्गा टेक्स मोर टाइम टू बी मेड सो ऑन सो फॉर्थ सो आई वुड इन इन दैट केस फॉर सच केस ऑफ वाइन नोइंग इज नॉट रेडी आई वुड ओपन अ बॉटल एवरी सिक्स मंथ्स और वंस अयर टू put it into my head what is the progression how quickly is this wine developing or slowly it's developing and what is the timeline so that i can educate myself to know okay this open 6 years later this open 3 years this ready to drink now so on and so forth so having heard the story i said okay I, I, i'll end up sacrificing a bottle no problem i opened one tasted it it wasn't ready okay no problem I took one bottle and I left it in a room in the house, without the fan in summer, 45 degrees. What will happen? Wine will turn to vinegar, get sour, go off. Okay, I throw it away. Month later, I opened that bottle, and sure enough, it had become fantastic. That one month of high heat, which is supposed to be the worst thing for a bottle of wine. had actually aged it considerably and 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 reached where it would have taken years of storage in the right condition so uh, and i i happened to be the president of founder president of something called iwfs international wine and food society delhi chapter it exists there's about 6000 branches all over the world is the oldest such gourmet food society founded by someone in Eng- england about 100 years ago yeah. and our first wine dinner we drank only champagne and that too we compared two champagnes 96 and 2002 different producers so we we tucker lug out them to see not only the variations in the vintages or variation between this producer that producer so on so forth so it's not only drinking great wines mythical wines but also uh, doing a little uh, liberal journey there yeah, you know so um, there's a great great producer in 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 champagne called philippe nay and i met charles and i said charles i'm planning to open the 96 and the 2002 what do you think about it He says, Rajiv, don't open the 2002. It's not ready to drink. I said, okay, fine. You know why open a great bottle like that when it's not ready to drink? So we we opened others. We opened other 96s, 2002s, so on and so forth. Two three days later, while the memory of that evening was still fresh in my mind, at home with a few other people they were from Australia who who also well, you know, experienced, I said, let's open this 2002, which Charles has said. is not ready to drink and worst case scenario it won't be ready so big deal we'll still enjoy it oh wait a minute it was singing the wine was ready and charles is, charles knows a lot more about his wine than i do he drunk a lot more of that than i do however the difference was what he was speaking in context of the wine that has been sitting in his cellar in champagne all its life time travel whether ages the wine and it can age to becoming better or it can age to getting worse so this bottle that we had opened that evening had been exported by them to the us which is where i bought it brought it back to india so it had done in its life two journeys that had resulted in a little bit more development than the wine that were in his things so it, it had aged a lot more and was ready so to that extent uh, and i told charles later on about it <laughs> he was uh, um, so anyway that's that's the an answer to your question okay thank you very much thank you everybody uh, a special uh, thank you to rajiv for being generous not only by by enlightening us on wine but also sharing a wine uh, and it's very rare i've seen such generosity so we have 12 bottles of wine um thanks to you <laughs>